Pete's Small World is a super duper popular ride at Disneyland. And, but how do we know this? And is it more popular than Pirates of the Caribbean? Say an outsider were to look. They, what they could do is they could look and they could see like how many boats were on each of the different rides. This is analogous to something called polyzone profiling, where we look to see how many ribosomes or protein making uh, machinery, um, how many of those are on a messenger RNA, so on the instruction for making a protein. You can also think about another way that you could see if a ride was more popular was if the park had like more copies of them. That doesn't make too much sense, but imagine that it's a small ride. It's world, that it's a small world ride is so so popular that they have to actually put more of the copies of this ride in the park because they even putting as many boats as they could onto that one ride they couldn't fill it enough. And so we've talked a lot about how we can use like QPCR. Um, like RT-QPCR, so reverse transcription and QPCR, to kind of count how many messenger RNAs there are for a given um, protein. So how many copies of their recipe are there out there for the ribosomes to be using? But another way that um, is important is that the number of ribosomes, it like how much are they actually being used? So if you have a bunch of it's a small world rides, but no one's on them, then that's not going to be like that thing's not very popular, right? And so another way that cells can control the amount of protein that they make is by controlling the number of ribosomes that are on these copies as additionally, in addition to controlling the number of copies. So ribos so polysome profiling is a way on, that we can add on top of the information that we get from the qPCR to figure out like how well these are actually being translated. Another technique that we can use is something called ribosome pinching or riboseq. And so basically this is looking to see where the ribosomes are on a messenger RNA. So you, it would be like in our, it's a small world um, analogy, it would be like take looking at the ride and seeing if there was a place where boats were getting held up. So maybe you have a bunch of copies of this ride, but they all have the same glitch in the track. Maybe there's a really sharp turn or something. And so the boats all have to slow down when they go around there. And so if you were to take a snapshot of where the boats were at a given time and then look and see where on the track they were, if there was a region with like a holdup, you would see a lot of um, a lot of boats at that one location. And so ribosome footprinting can give us a way to actually see where on a messenger RNA the ribosome are and whether regions are being translated more or less slowly. Um, and so we can use all of these techniques um, to complement one another to get more information about um, the process of translation, so the making of proteins. Um, and so the important thing when the remember though is that with polyzone profiling, you're looking at how many boats are on each ride, how many messenger RNAs are on each um, how many ribosomes are in, on each messenger RNA. And then in the case with ribosome sequence, riboseq or ribosome footprinting, you're looking to see where the um, where the boats are on the ride. So where the um, ribosomes are on the messenger RNA. And then we could do things like um, if we take into account the length of a gene and that sort of thing, we can then be able to compare between them. And this would be like if we are comparing between it's a small world and um, and uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. So when like, you can think that when a messenger RNA becomes like more popular, its ribosome density is going to increase. So this is the average number of ribosomes per messenger RNA for that gene. So it's like your average number of boats on each copy of the ride. And also you're, you can, um, the popularity, it'll increase your ribosome occupancy. So the number of messenger RNAs of the gene bound by the ribosome. So how many copies of the ride actually have the boats on them? So this is what I was talking about when you could have a bunch of copies of the It's a Small World ride, but if people aren't on them, then it's really not that popular. So different RNA, mRNAs are gonna be different lengths and the longer the length, the more ribosomes can be bound at a time, but the longer that it'll take each to finish. So you can take this into account and look at the ribosomes per length unit when you're comparing between them so that we can have a fairer estimate of Pirates of the Caribbean um, versus It's a Small World. And of course, these things are going to change. So it all depends on kind of like your audience and that sort of thing. So if you're going in the middle of a school week, maybe It's a Small World, ride is more popular. But if you're going in the afternoon after school gets out, um, 
sorry, if you're going in like the big early, if you're going in the middle of the day in the school week, um, maybe there's, it's a small world is going to be more popular because you're going to get the younger crowd. Whereas if you go later, maybe once the older kids are off school, maybe on their spring break or something like that, then um, Pirates of the Caribbean might be more popular. Similarly, we can look and see which messenger RNAs are being tra um, translated more or less, um, how well in various things under different conditions. And so this can give us insight about when a gene, when a cell thinks it's important to make various proteins versus others. Um, so let's look in a little more detail. So going back to the very basics, the instructions for making a protein are in the form of DNA, in the form of a gene. Um, messenger RNA copies of that gene get made, and those then um, get used by these ribosomes to, in the process of translation, to make a protein. And all of these steps are subject to various levels of regulation to control the actual amounts of the protein that are present in the cell at any given time. There are different, because you have all these different levels of regulation, there, it's important that you can then look and see how this regulation is occurring at these various level. So at the transcriptional level, how many messenger RNA copies are getting made? At the um, post-transcriptional level, are those decaying? At the translational level, um, how much are those being translated? And then like post-translational, um, are they being degraded and that sort of thing? And so we're gonna focus in on this translational step. Um, and look at two uh, methods that are sometimes used to measure translation, polysome profiling and riboseq or ribosome footprinting. So it's important that we know like what we're talking about when we're talking about translation. So basically we have this complex called the ribosome and it has these two halves, this large subunit and this small subunit. It's going to um, travel along the messenger RNA and use the messenger RNA instructions to put in the corresponding amino acids. And so three of the letters um, in the messenger RNA will be like a codon. And then this, R this transfer RNA is going to serve as the go-between between the messenger RNA and the amino acid that it codes for. So the amino acids are the protein letters. And this is saying, OK, this codon, so this three-letter chunk is saying, OK, add this amino acid. And then a tRNA with a complementary anticodon, so it has the three letters that match those then it's going to bring the corresponding amino acid and the ribosome is going to add it to the chain. And so the ribosome has this really important role. It's helping, um, that's um, catalyzing the, the, this like chain formation. So you get this, pro, this long chain of amino acids linked up and then this is going, this polypeptide is folding up into a functional protein. And so, if you want to make more of a protein, you can think about the cell being able to do a couple of things. It can increase the number of copies. And this is what we look at when we're doing something like RTQBCR, where we're looking at the number of, basically, the more copies you have, the more uh, protein you can make. But also, and so then you can measure the amounts of copies you have to get information about how uh, much protein was likely getting made. But the difference we're talking about when we're talking about these um, ribosomal strategies is that we're actually looking at how many ribosomes are on each copy, because in addition to making more copies, you can increase the usage of each copy. So when we think about a tra translation occurring, it's easy to think about a single ribosome moving along a messenger RNA. But in fact, ribosomes are often... Um, they kind of have, you have lots of ribosomes on a messenger or multiple ribosomes on a messenger RNA at the same time. It wouldn't be very efficient if you just had a single ribosome on it. We call the messenger RNAs um, with the single ribosome, we call these like monosomes. And they're not very efficient because you have all this space and there's plenty of room for multiple ribosomes to be kind of like going um, next to each other. So this is not very efficient if you just have one. If you have multiple, we call these a polysome. So a polysome is when you have a messenger RNA with multiple ribosomes on it, and it's going to be more efficient. So if we're able to tell apart how many, um, like a various gene, does it have a lot of ribosome, poly, polysomes? So does it have a lot of ribosomes on it? Or do you just see a lot of monosomes? So is it just like you have these single um, ribosomes on it, not very efficiently being translated? If we could separate these and see where a gene, um, where the messenger RNA, like how 
Is it mostly in the polysome? Is it mostly in the monosome? Is it being translated or not? And so polysome profiling is going to allow us to do this, where we're going to separate these using this gradient. And then we can look and see where the messenger RNA that we were interested in was. So these polydome sedimentation, um, both this like density gradient. And so you make this gradient of sucrose typically. Um, so it's sugar. It's heavy, so the solution stuff's traveling, the, the, the stuff is traveling in is going to get more and more dense as you go down. And molecules are going to sink until they reach a point in the gradient with a matching density. So the more messenger, the more ribosomes are on a messenger RNA, the denser it'll be and the further down it'll sink. So how do we can take a mix of these like a cell by say or whatever we can, um, take, purify out the ribosomes with the RNA that they're bound on, and then we can send them through this gradient. And what's going to happen is that the more um, ribosomes on them, the further down they're going to sink. And the ones without ribosomes or with just like monosomes are going to be higher up. And then you can, what you can do is because RNA and protein absorb UV light, you can use a UV, UV detector to find them. So you can kind of be scanning in here. Um, when, once you make this, you stop the spinning. And so they're all stuck in place. Then you look and see where they are. And you can actually extract the fractions out that contain the various things. So if you then take these fractions and you can say, okay, as a higher percent of sucrose, this is going to be down here further. This is going to be where you have more ribosomes. And up here in this light stuff, this is going to be like the individual subunit. So this large subunit, the 60S, and the small subunit, the 40S, um, in the case of eukaryotic ribosomes. Um, and then you have the monosomes. This is where you have an R messenger RNA with a single ribosome. And then the polysomes, where you have multiple. You can actually see the different numbers of ribosomes. So you have like two, three, four, five. Once you get past like eight, up to eight or so, um, then it's just too many to tell. So you can't tell them apart. But you would know that if you saw your messenger RNA here, it would probably be something that was highly translated. But how would you actually be able to find what it was? So here, you'd have to actually probe or, or do some sequencing to figure out what it was that was actually there, um, like, or where your gene actually was. So if you want to know like which ones are in the polysome fraction versus the monosome fraction, you could do some sort of like sequencing and sequence all of these and sequence all of these, sequence the RNA that it's like um, coming down with it. But if there's a specific RNA that you're interested in, then you can use something um, like a northern blot or QPCR. So the classical way is with the northern blot. So basically you have a probe that is going to be complementary to the sequence that you are um, looking for. And so this is gonna be a specific sequence that's going to, um, to bind specifically to the messenger RNA that you're interested in. So if you want to know if the It's a Small World ride is going to is more popular or not, then you would have a probe that would match the It's a Small World ride. Um, typically these are radio labeled. Then you can run a gel electrophoresis to separate the RNA by size, transfer them to a membrane, um, and then probe them for the, the RNA of interest. Um, so more on this in the post I did the other day. Um, another alternative is to use qPCR, and so we talked about qPCR before is count in the form of the RT qPCR. So if you start with the messenger RNA, and then you can reverse transcribe it, so make DNA copies of the messenger RNA, and then make lots and copies of those. So that would be RT qPCR, but you can actually just use qPCR, so quantitative qPCR or PCR. The basic idea is that you can measure the amounts of copies as they're getting made. And so if you can measure the amounts of copies as they're getting made, the more copies you start with, the faster that the signal is going to grow. And so you can use this to figure out how much you started with. And so you can use qPCR with primers, so with these little like um, starting points for the copying, the, these little pieces of DNA that are bookending the region. You can do this with primers that are specific for, your, for the messenger RNA you're interested in. And therefore, you can count the number of copies. If there's not a lot of copies there, or there's no copies there, you're not going to get. Um, if there's no copies there, you're not going to get a signal. And if there's not very many, you're not going to get a very strong signal. And if there's a lot, you're going to get a strong signal. And so you can use this as a way to test for the presence of the different of the protein of interest in the different fractions.
So that's if you want to look at individual messenger RNAs. But you can also tell things about like the global level of translation by looking at like kind of how much monosomes you have versus polysomes. And so if you make a cell mad, so if you disrupt the global translation, like if you add arsenic, then you're going to see a shift towards the monosomes. So fewer messenger RNAs have multiple ribosomes on them. So remember, the more, the higher the percentage of sucrose, the, that's going to be like more ribosomes on you here. Whereas the lower percentage of sucrose, then we're going to have more of the monosomes. Um, and so if you then, if you had a lot of translation going, then you would ex expect there to be more of the polysomes. If you had some sort of block for um, global translation, you'd get more of the monosomes. So that was polysome profiling. But what if we wanted to see where the ribosomes actually were? We can do this using ribosome footprinting. So here we can use RNAs, so RNA cutters, to cut up the messenger RNA around the ribosomes. The ribosomal footprint is around 30 nucleotides long. Um, so basically, the ribosome is protecting the region from getting cut in this re the region that is bound on from getting cut in this region is about 30 nucleotides. The actual exact length of the region can actually vary um, depending on the ribosomal state and that sort of thing. Um, so there's things that you can look into with that. But the basic idea is that you want to see where the ribosome is bound. And so you can cut around it then you let them release them, so get them unstuck from that RNA that they were protecting, and then you sequence it to see where the ribosomes were bound. So what you're going to see when you sequence them is you're kind of going to see the sum of all the copies. So you're, the slow zones are going to be overrepresented. So this is like in our It's a Small World ride, if there was that sharp curve, then if you were to look at all the rides, you'd see an increase in the number of the, the, um, the boats at that site. So overrepresentation can indicate a slowly translated region. Um, so this could be maybe because maybe you have a rare codon. Um, so it takes a while to find this matching tRNA. Or maybe you have a structural barrier um, in the messenger RNA. And so these are various types of things that you can see with RiboSeq. If you want to get an idea about the efficiency of a gene being translated, you can get information from the sequencing, from seeing where the ribosomes are bound, and then comparing this to the total amounts of copies of those. So if you do just like RNA-seq, so you're sequencing all of the RNA um, or mRNA, um, depending on what method you use, then you can compare the amounts of ribosomes found. Um, so how much do you see that that sequence in the ribosome fraction, protected fraction, how much do you see that compared to the number of the messenger RNAs for that that there actually are? There are a lot of other variations and other things to take into account and other um, things like that. Like typically what you're doing when you're doing these is you actually spike in some known RNA. Um, so you have some sort of internal control so that if you purify a fraction, um, and you see a lot more messenger RNAs, um, or you see that sequence a lot more, then that's not necessarily, that you wanna make sure that that's not just because you did a better job of extracting the RNA from that fraction. Um, and so you actually can spike in during the purification, spike in a known sequence, and then you can um, compare the amount of that sequence you see to, these, um, to the sequences that you're measuring that correspond to your actual sample. So these are just a few examples of things that you can do. Um, and there are other methods as well, um, various things. There's also complicating factors, how sometimes you can get things that look like they are um, polysomes, but they're not really. And you can have these things where there's kind of like stalled um, ribosomes. So there's various nuances. And as I learn more about these techniques um, in the coming weeks and months, um, hopefully I will be able to better explain them to you. But I just want to start with this kind of overview of these various techniques of um, polysome profiling and ribosome footprinting or riboseq.